No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. That's what John tells us in John 1 and verse 18. And we, and we set out at the beginning of this year with our plan to read Matthew and John with the goal, with the goal of coming to know Jesus better and in the process of knowing him better to know God better along the way. That's how we began 2020. And I would think that talking to a crowd like this about about reading the Gospels and coming to know Jesus, that's, well, that's pretty obvious stuff, right? That we can read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and come to know Jesus. What I need to say to you this morning is that is not as obvious to everybody else. That, in fact, there's a growing crowd in our religious world, increasingly doubtful that we can really find Jesus today. For example, this last week I was reading this one religious scholar who said, you know, you can read the Gospels, and reading them you might be able to pick up on some broad patterns that might give us some vague notions about who Jesus is. But he went on to say this. He said, we cannot possibly know the historicity of any single incident related in the Gospels. Did you catch that? In other words, what the writers said Jesus did, we can't really know if he did any of that at all, but he wasn't done. He went on to say we can't possibly know the authenticity of any single saying attributed to him. So the sermons that, that Matthew says he preached, the miracles that John says he worked, we can't know if... If, if those are any of the things that Jesus said or did. In fact, finally, he says, we can't possibly identify the truth of any given verse in the gospel. Freedom. You can't know if any of them are true. In fact, Frank Zindler, an atheist, goes even further than that. He says, I, have, I, I now feel that it is more reasonable to suppose that Jesus never existed. Some even go that far and say, it's not just that we can't find him, we can't find him because he's not there. The stories of Jesus like an onion, you keep peeling back the layers and you get to the middle and find what? Nothing. Here's what I want to say to you about that. When you encounter people who say things like that or encounter a YouTube video that talks about that kind of stuff, don't freak out. Just because maybe it's new to you and you've never heard that before, let me assure you, it is not new for people to say things like that. In fact, critics have literally written volumes and volumes of speculation about every facet of the story about Jesus. For example, critics are going to tell you that the gospel writers were biased. They were his friends, after all. And they, they tweaked his story to make Jesus look good, or in some cases, like the resurrection, they just made stuff up. They, they lied about him. That's what critics say. Or they will tell us that down through times as those scribes copied the Bible by hand, and that's right, they didn't have a, a copy machine. They literally wrote the Bible by hand. And you know some of those guys didn't like some of that stuff, and so they left off stuff they didn't like or added some stuff in that they thought would help them out in some kind of theological argument. In fact, sometimes we hear stories about entire books of the Bible maybe a PBS special about entire books of the Bible that have been lost or left out because people didn't like what they said. Take all that together, and let me tell you what the fundamental point is when you get right down to the bottom of that. What they're trying to say to us is that we can't find Jesus today. We can search and search and search, but, but Jesus, if he ever existed at all, will always be an obscure figure that men can't really know. So much for our mission in 2020 to know Jesus, right? And so I thought about that the last couple of weeks, and it seemed to me important that here at the start of the year that we at least take some time to validate what we're trying to do this year, to demonstrate that we can 
find Jesus today. In fact, what I'd like to do is put five facts on the table today that I believe make an unimpeachable case that you can find and know Jesus today. And working from those facts, I think we can build a foundation, a solid foundation for the work we're going to be doing this year. So, got a little spot in the back of your Bible, you're going to write these down. These are the reasons we can know that we can find Jesus today. We, number one, we know we can find Jesus, first of all, because we know that Jesus lived. I just think it's bizarre that I have to make that point this morning. That there is still any question out there at all about the historicity of Jesus, about whether or not he is in fact a real person. But oddly enough, even in our day, with all the evidence we have, there are people like R.G. Price in his book, Jesus, A Very Jewish Myth, argues that the story of Jesus developed out of ex existing Jewish messianic literature and that there is no real historical Jesus at the core of the story. See what he's saying? It was just a bunch of myths that kind of came together. But if you really dig down all the way to the bottom, what we find is there's nothing there. There is no Jesus. When I read assertions like that, I'm just made to wonder, what evidence do we need to prove that someone from antiquity existed? What are they looking for? How do we know Jesus was a real person? Well, let's start with the book you're holding this morning, right? you got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You've got four accounts of the life of Jesus that tell us all about what he said and what he did and about his resurrection. So let's begin there. We have this historical testimony. Now, let's just pause right there. I'm not talking about whether or not the Bible is inspired. That's a whole other issue in and of itself. Let's just think of the Gospels as history books. Ladies and gentlemen, the Gospels can be demonstrated to be some of the most reliable and trustworthy history books that come to us from antiquity. So starting right there, we have that record, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that tell us Jesus existed. But that's not all we have. Don't let a critic ever tell you, well, all you got is the Gospel. That's not all we have. In fact, in the days that followed the life of Jesus. Literally for centuries, religious writers wrote about Jesus, in essence replicating everything that's in the Gospels. Every piece of his life was talked about or commented about. His sermons were reproduced in the writings of the early Christian authors. So we have all of that information as well. Now here's the interesting thing. We don't need that either. To know that Jesus is a real person. We don't know, we don't need what the gospel writers said. We don't need what the early Christians wrote about him to prove that. We have other historical sources, Jewish sources like Josephus who wrote about Jesus, or Roman sources like Tacitus or Pliny the Younger who wrote about Jesus. In fact, it is interesting that Dr. Edwin Yamauchi makes this observation. He says, without any of the gospels or any Christian writings at all, let me tell you what we can know about Jesus just from other historical sources. Listen to this. He says, we can know that Jesus was a Jewish teacher, that many people believed that he performed healings and exorcism. Some people believed that he was the Messiah. He was rejected by Jewish leaders. He was crucified under Pontius Pilate in the reign of Tiberius. Despite his, this shameful death, his followers believed that he was still alive and spread beyond Palestine so that there were multitudes of them in Rome by AD 64. And all kinds of people from cities and countrysides, men and women, slave and free, worshipped him as God. We can know all of that about Jesus without relying on the Gospels or any other Christian source. Even the critic Bart Ehrman, who, trust me, ladies and gentlemen, is no friend to the text of Scripture, no friend to Christianity. Even one of the greatest critics of Christianity, Bart Ehrman, said this. He said, we must not deny what virtually every sane historian on the planet, Christian, Jewish, Muslim, pagan, agnostic, atheist, what have you, has come to conclude based on a range of compelling historical evidence. Whether we like it or not, Jesus certainly existed. So let's begin there, right? People can argue that there wasn't a real Jesus, but that's a joke. 
No serious historian believes that. So, first of all, we can find him because he lived. But then let's build the case secondly by adding this. We can find him because his life was public. Let's say that secondly. Add that stone to the foundation. His life was public. What do I mean by that? Well, it isn't as though this Jesus, that this Jesus was some kind of religious hermit who lived in a cave off in some remote mountain somewhere and had a group of followers around him. And a thousand years after he died, some writings came along about what his followers said that he believed and taught. That is not who Jesus was. In fact, are you still in John 1? We started in John 1 and verse 18, back up to verse 14. This is John 1 and verse 14, where John says, and the Word, talking about Jesus, the Word became flesh and what? You see it? Dwelt among us. Right. I'm asking for participation when I pause like that, so you were kind of quiet too. I was waiting for you there. Became flesh and dwelt among us, and we What? saw his glory. Glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. When John presents Jesus to us, he presents him as God who was seen. He lived among us, and we saw him. In fact, huge crowds saw him. In Luke chapter 5, it was a crowd that numbered perhaps into the tens of thousands who listened to him teach on that occasion and watched him perform that miracle when he fed, well, we say he fed the 5,000. There were 5,000 men that were fed. Who knows how large that crowd really was. He, was. he was doing these things, brothers and sisters, in the open. He was a public figure. In fact, in fact, even his enemies were acquainted with the most important details of his life. In Luke chapter 5, there's that incident where he heals the paralytic, right? And yes, he had friendly people in the crowd, like the guys breaking up that ceiling, trying to get that paralytic guy down in there. Fenner, you'd gone nuts if he tried to do that at your house, right? But you know, there were enemies in that crowd. And when Jesus said, to that paralytic man, your sins are forgiven you. They rose up. They were upset about there. They were about that. There were critics in the crowd who heard the claims and knew that he was claiming to be God when he did that. But they also saw what? When Jesus spoke the word, that's right, Wesley. They saw the man get up and walk. So what I want you to appreciate is that even his enemies were aware. They were in the crowds. They heard the claims and the teaching, and they witnessed the miracles. In fact, his enemies, brothers and sisters, were key players in the most important miracle, which is what? The resurrection. That is exactly right. Realize his opponents were key players in that. In Matthew chapter 27 and verse 62, after Jesus is executed on the cross, the Jews knew about this story that he claimed he was going to rise from the dead. And so they took measures to ensure that the tomb was guarded. They didn't want a resurrection myth rising up. And then when Jesus did rise in the, from the dead in Matthew 28 and in verse 11, it was the Jews who concocted this story about the disciples stealing the body as a cover story for the resurrection. What I want you to see is that even the enemies of Jesus are involved in all the important events of his life. He was a public figure. Do you see that? So much so that if you go ahead to Acts 2, this is Acts 2 and verse 22. Now we're up to the day of Pentecost, and in Acts 2 and verse 22, Peter stands up. Listen to what he says, verse 22. Men of Israel... Listen to these words. Jesus, the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs, which God performed through him, where? In your midst, just as you yourselves know. I love that. Peter stands up on Pentecost. You know what he says? Jesus worked miracles. And you know it, because he did it right in the middle for all of us to see. And so why do we know we can find Jesus? First of all, we know that because he really existed. Not only did he exist, but Jesus was a public figure. What he claimed and taught and did, he did in front of everybody. And then thirdly, we know we can find Jesus today. Thirdly, because records were made about all of this. Now I'm heading to Luke's gospel. Will you go to Luke chapter 1? I know we're reading Matthew and John this year, but just by virtue of doing that, you know that we're going to end up hitting some of these other Gospels too. And I want to grab a little piece of Luke this morning. This is Luke chapter 1, 
I just want you to notice the way he begins this gospel. This is Luke 1 and verse 1. He writes this. He says, Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. It seemed fitting for me as well, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning, to write it out for you in consecutive order, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the exact truth about the things you have been taught. Now, I want you to forget for a moment that Luke was inspired by the Holy Spirit, okay? All we're concerned about right now is Luke as a historian. That's it. And I want you to notice some things we learned here at the beginning of his gospel about Luke as a historian. First of all, if you read the first couple of verses, do you see that there's clearly a concern with records being made? Somebody needs to write this down. What Jesus said and did, that needs to be recorded. And so Luke is going to participate in that writing as well. But notice, secondly, this concern that he has with reliable testimony. Do you see the reference in verse 2, how this was handed down from eyewitnesses? Why would eyewitness testimony be important? This isn't something that someone just heard, folks. This wasn't a story going around. What we're reporting comes from people who were on the scene, things that were actually witnessed by them. And then the third thing I want you to notice here is that they are very concerned about being careful. Do you notice in verse 3 that he says that he's investigated everything carefully? Do you see that? And then in verse 4, He tells Theophilus, I'm doing this because I want you to know the exact truth about what you've been taught. And so these guys first were concerned about making records, and in the making of records, they were concerned about working with good information, and thirdly, thirdly, they were concerned about accurately recording what had happened. I just want to ask, do you think Luke's a pretty good historian? Sure seems to me that this guy is very concerned about making sure that he gets things right. People who dismiss the apostles and the New Testament writers and say, well, they were just friends of Jesus, they can't be trusted, they don't have a shred of evidence to make that claim. They say it against all the evidence to the contrary. It seems to me, it seems to me that Luke is a pretty is a pretty careful historian in what he's recording here. Now let's add the fact that these records began to be made shortly after the events took place. You see why that's important, right? Because it's tough getting old, isn't it, Wesley? And the longer a story goes on and gets circulated around, a story can begin to change. It's like that fish you caught. That was about three ounces. And by the time 40 years have gone by, it's 20 pounds, right? You know how that happens? Stories grow and stories change. And that's one of the things that is said about the stories of Jesus. Well, those are just legends that just got circulated around for a long time and and then grew into something more than they really were. But that's not true. Folks, the entire New Testament was completed by AD 100. Within 70 years of the death of Jesus. And the truth is most of the Gospels were written a whole lot earlier than that, like maybe 20 or 30 years after the death of Jesus. And so and so the records begin to be made very soon after the events that took place. Think about this. If you are writing about Jesus 20 years after he died, you realize there are still lots of people alive, friend and enemy, who were there who had witnessed these events. If they were making this stuff up, those people would have known. How could Peter have ever stood up on Pentecost in Acts 2 and 22 in Jerusalem and said, this guy worked miracles and you all know it. How could he say that if that wasn't true? His critics would have never let him get away with that. They would have challenged him on every bit of it. His testimony would have been dismissed as irrelevant, as a fraud fact that the records began to be made so soon after the events only ensures that the records were accurate. But I know another reason they were accurate, and it's another reason that we know we can find Jesus today. We know that they were accurate because these guys who wrote were trustworthy. And we need to say that emphatically this morning because I'm going to tell you, the gospel writers, 
get an awful lot of criticism. You will hear people who are critical of Christianity talk about how, well, you can't trust him because they were his friends. You know, you can't trust anyone's friend to tell the truth about him. Who made that up? How do you know that that's true? Lots of books are written by people who were friendly with the source. That was also accurate in the retelling of the story. That's just an assumption that people, that people jump to. But we can't trust these guys to tell the truth, they say, because they were Jesus' friends. And so they made up the stuff about him. And you know what parts they made up, right? They made up this stuff about his miracles. That needs to tell you something. And they made up this stuff about the resurrection. The bottom line is you can't trust these guys to tell the truth. And here's what I want to say about that. That accusation, brothers and sisters, is made against all evidence to the contrary. First of all, I don't think they had a choice to be dishonest. These stories had been written a thousand years later. That would have been one thing. But 20 or 30 years when people are still around, when enemies are still around who know the truth, you can't make this stuff up. Nobody would have believed a word that they said. But I don't think it's just that. I think the writings themselves testify of their honesty. Do you remember a year or so ago? It was on a Sunday night. We were looking at some of the evidence for the Bible being trustworthy. And we, do you remember us talking about some of the embarrassing details? Do you remember that? That we find in the gospel? Do you ever wonder why we're told? about all the apostles falling asleep when they were in the garden with Jesus? Who knew that, folks? Only the apostles did. Frankly, I'd have gotten the guys together and say, don't tell that part. We don't look good. Leave that out. If you're making up a story, make yourself look good, right? And if you're making it up, what about Peter's denial? What's up? Why is that in the Bible? This pillar of the church. This awful moment. Why don't you leave that out? What about the moments during Jesus' ministry when his own apostles are confused and don't understand what it is he's trying to teach? How about the fact that when the initial reports of the resurrection came, it was the women who saw and believed and his own apostles who were doubtful? That doesn't sound like somebody who's making up a story to me. The fact that they tell the story in a way that makes themselves look bad, I think is evidence that they were just trying to tell the truth. But you know what's more fundamental, the more basic question that needs to be asked? If they were lying about Jesus, what was their motive? When people lie, they usually have a motive, right? What are they trying to get out of this? Fortune? They didn't make any money on this. Some great position of notoriety? They were scandalous, rejects in their culture. Many of the witnesses lived difficult lives and endured persecution. Some even died because they were unwilling to recant their testimony that he died and rose again, and we saw it. I know that it is not uncommon for men to die for a lie, but I tell you what doesn't ever happen. Men don't lie for, die for something they know is a lie. And that would have been true of these men. They would know the stories about the resurrection was a fraud because they made it up. If men who will give their lives for their testimony, if they can't be trusted to tell the truth, I wonder, who can you trust to tell the truth? I know that you're going to hear people all the time say, you can't trust those men who, who wrote the Gospels. You can't trust them to tell the truth. The question is, where are your, where's your evidence for that? What reason do I have to believe that? Because i got to tell you, I could pile up a whole bunch of reasons to demonstrate that they were trustworthy. We should listen to them. 
Which brings me to a final thing this morning. If it is true that Jesus lived and that he was public and records were made about what he did and those ec- records were, were accurately made by those who wrote, then the last thing we need to say is this, that those records have been accurately preserved all the way down to this time. That's the last issue. And boy, there's another battle waged here with critics. They would say, well, maybe what was originally written, maybe, maybe Matthew really had it straight. But then you got that scribe, right, a thousand years later who's looking at what Matthew said and he doesn't like some of that so he starts leaving stuff off as he copies it and adding stuff in that he wanted in there now forget for a moment the impossibility of do that right thousand years after the death of Jesus folks there are tens of thousands of copies of scripture floating around if you're going to change it you've got to go around the whole world and change tens of thousands of copies if you could run them all down forget about the impossibility of what has been proposed they don't need evidence they just make the claim Oh, it's been changed down through time or or books of scripture altogether have been lost so that we can't even really know well that opens a can of worms How long y'all want to stay this morning? Y'all didn't want lunch today anyway, because we could go for a long, long time talking about how we know Scripture's been accurately preserved. I'm just going to say two quick things, and then I'm going to wrap up. First thing I'm going to say is this. Now, historians actually have a method, several methods, for testing documents to determine this very question. Have they been accurately handed down to us? I won't get into what all those tests are. They look at some external information like, did it come from eyewitnesses, which the Gospels talk about, and and can we be sure that they were reliable? And then look at things like how many copies we have, and do the copies agree with each other? All kinds of tests. And they use this with all kinds of books to determine if something written a long time ago has been accurately preserved all the way to the day. And so what you can do is you can take the Bible, just as a historical work, and submit it to those tests, and guess what you find? Well, it would be wrong to say that it passes the test. In fact, the truth is, the Bible doesn't pass the test. The Bible is at the head of the class. In fact, that's not even accurate to say. The Bible is by far and beyond every other work from antiquity. You know what I mean by that? There is more evidence, far more evidence, to support the integrity of your Bible, to demonstrate that it has been accurately preserved through time than any other book from antiquity that nobody ever begins to question. Folks, it is not an issue of has the text been accurately transmitted so that when you and I read our Bible, we know we're reading Matthew. That's not the problem. The problem is what Matthew said, that Jesus died and rose again, and proved he was God in the flesh. That's the problem. You take that miraculous stuff out of the Bible, and you know what people would say about it? Everybody would say about it. It's one of the most, it is the most reliable, trustworthy, historical source that comes to us from antiquity. The problem is not with how the text has come to us. The problem is people don't like what's in the text. And so that's why they make these quibbles. Don't ever doubt that when you read Matthew over the course of this year, you're reading what Matthew, a reliable, trustworthy witness, wrote. Now, I said I was going to say two things about that. Second thing I want to say is this, is if you believe God was involved in this process in any way, There's no other conclusion that can be reached. Now, someone could claim that I think the Bible is a pure to human work, and that's another discussion to have at another time. But if you believe that God in any way was involved in the production of a record that would tell the story of his son and how he came to be a savior and how he reveals God to us and what his expectations are, if you believe God was in any way involved in that, you've got to believe that this book is absolutely what God wanted you and I to know. Because, folks, if God determined to produce a book and he failed, we got bigger issues, right? God does not fail at what he determines to do. And he determined to give us his word in this book. And that's what we have. And that's where this is going. If all this is true, that Jesus really lived, that his life was public, that records were made by trustworthy men and they've been handed down to us, then what do we know? That God came 
in the person of Jesus. And he died on the cross to save us from sin, and he rose from the grave to give us victory over death. And the only way you and I get to the Father is through him. If this is true, if this is true, that's the only way. And so if you're sitting there in this crowd today, the question you need to answer right now is what do you believe? Do you believe the book is from God? Do you believe he's the Savior? Jesus said in Luke 6, 46, why do you call me Lord, Lord? And do not do what I say. You need to do what he say, whether that's to line your life up with his. Maybe as a disciple you've gotten off the path, or maybe you've never cho- made the choice for him to be your Savior. You need to respond to the truth that is in his word. You need to do that today. Make your way to the front right now while we stand, while we sing.